do you want to stand up and rest yourself a minute quietly and not yak to your neighbor because I want to tell you something while you're standing. If you'd rather be seated, just be seated. If you want to stand up and rest yourself, go ahead. There is a lady here tonight who wanted to come to this convention so badly that she called the sheriff of Sevier County, that's this county, and said, I want to come to the convention. Will you come and get me? She lives 45 minutes on the other side of Knoxville. He said, yes, I will. And he did. And she's here. Now that's, you gotta be wanting to come bad to get that to happen. When you see her, you will know her. You can't miss her. She has a little hat on. She has a red jacket on covered with emblems. She's in a wheelchair. And she is the chaplain for the Tennessee Sheriff's Association, a holiness lady. And she has been responsible personally for putting the Ten Commandments in almost every county in Tennessee. Her name is June Griffin, and she wants to talk to you about you getting the Ten Commandments in every sheriff's office in your state. She has flown. She called me the other day. She said, I found somebody to fly me to Indiana to give those two sheriffs up there in your area, those two holiness men that were elected, I want them to have my Ten Commandments display. It's this big. She said, I'm flying up there. I want you to arrange a patriotic service. So I did, we held a patriotic service in the Church of the Nazarene in Liberty, Indiana, and folk gathered in from all around that area to support those two holiness sheriffs that were elected in Indiana this year. And you can do that in your state. She wants to talk to you about it. You can't miss her. She'll be right outside here. She's, uh, she said, what time should I tell the sheriff? It'll be over. My wife said, well, tell him 930. That way you'll have plenty of time to visit after the service. She'll be out here. You can't miss her, I'm telling you. She's got a, a button from every sheriff's, every sheriff's department in this state uh, on her, uh, sewn on her jacket. You can't miss her. All right, that's the announcement. Thank you for being quiet. You can be seated. Well, different people have said, are you going to tell us your story? No. I'm going to preach the story I've been preaching for 44 years, and it's in the Bible. And so I hope you brought your Bible tonight. Some time ago, I shared this at God's Missionary Preachers Meeting in a small way in an afternoon service to about 22 or 3 people. And it was not taped, and uh, I had just written out some things really fast on the, on the back of a piece of paper while I was there because I'm a last minute kind of person. I take one message at a time. And uh, so uh, after that was over, I put it away because I thought, well, that's an insignificant message, probably never use it again, wrote it at the last minute, not much to it, put it away. And while I was in another meeting that was not being live streamed either, uh, I felt like the Lord said, get that out again. You're not done with that. I've got some more things I want to tell you about that scripture. So the Lord told me a few more things. I wrote another outline. I preached it there to about 55 people. It wasn't recorded. Well, this afternoon, well, really yesterday at 3 a.m., the Lord woke me up and said, uh, I'm not done telling you about that scripture, and I want you to throw those other two outlines away, and tomorrow I'm going to tell you what I want you to really say to IHC crowd about this. And so this afternoon, I wrote a new outline about this same scripture. Paul Lucas told me, you don't want to fly the plane at IHC until you've had it off the ground a time or two somewhere else. So we've had Kitty Hawk, and we had the open air uh, single engine plane, and now we're going to try for the double, the double prop tonight and see if we can make that fly. And I'll tell you what, I got blessed. Uh, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you want me to preach this at IHC, you're going to have to show me because to me it's a prayer meeting talk. And God just came in the car and I wept so that I pulled over to the side of the, of the road and I knew God wanted this for here tonight. 
I know it. I know it. I know it. Second Kings chapter 6. I want to use two words in verse 5. Verse 5, two words. Second line of the fifth verse, the axe. The axe. That's it. The axe. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. And of course, we can do nothing on our own. We, we learned a long time ago that we can't preach much really on our own at all. And we depend upon the blessed Holy Ghost to come and help us. We ask you that you'll come help me not to say anything that I shouldn't say, to leave out anything that's not important. And if, there's, if there are things that are not in the outline, Lord, just reveal them quickly. And we'll just follow your will because we want your will. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, in this chapter, um, and I'm just going to tell you, I didn't read the whole thing because I don't want to be redundant. I'm going to refer to it, so just leave your Bible open. But I, I want to notice, first of all, in this story, it, it's the, the full picture, and I think it says... Uh, in your Bible, it'll tell you, Elisha causes iron to swim. That's what it says in mine, in the heading. And so uh, that's, that's a little miracle that's stuck in here uh, between several others. And it seems a little bit insignificant because it's only seven verses long and there's not much really to it. Uh, you just kind of read over it and you think, oh, that was nice, that was sweet, that was, uh, that was interesting. And then where's the next miracle, the big one, the, the real one? But I notice, first of all, in this story, uh, the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, verse 1, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. S-T-R-A-I-T. -T. Yeah. Now don't get this confused with crooked and straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. -T. No, this is straight, like a straight jacket. You know what that is? Some of you do. <laughs> Straight. It's confining. It's stifling. So this place is too straight for us. You see, why is the place too straight? And I want you to get this. There's a few little things I want you to pick up on here. And it's 25 after. First of all, they had a prophet. They had a prophet. That's point one for you that are writing. Point one, they had a prophet. In 2 Kings 3.11, the king is looking for one. And one of the king's servants said, Well, there's Elisha, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know, he's the one that followed Elijah around. He, you know, Elijah was a great man of God. And here, the, the boy that followed him all around and poured water on his hands, he's here. I just want to tell you tonight, everybody doesn't start out in some great place, but we're allowed by the great mercies of God to pour water on somebody's hands. That's where greatness begins. Elisha's greatness didn't start when the, when the double portion happened. It started right here while he's pouring water. And I want to tell you tonight, some of you may feel like you're insignificant. The church you pastor is small. Your Sunday school class is small. You're in Bible school and nobody knows your last name. Fear not. Keep pouring water on the hands of the prophet. And you know, if he's doing that... That means he's sticking by the prophet a lot. He was a servant to the prophet Elijah. That's who we're talking about tonight. He started out as a water pourer. The king says concerning Elisha, after he'd just been told, the boy that poured water on Elijah's hands is here. The king says, the word of the Lord is with him. I want to tell you tonight, if you've got a pastor that the word of the Lord is with him, 
you got yourself a prophet. Say, well, pastors aren't important. We can do without them. No, they're not. You're wrong. End of story. I know a lot of large churches that go through a list of 10 to 14 people that tell them no. They think, oh, we're going to get Daryl Statler. We're going to get Dan Statler. We're going to get James Plank. No. No, you're not. No. You may get a boy who's been pouring water. And if you do, and he has the word of the Lord with him, you got yourself a prophet. Whew. What do prophets look like? Well, with Elisha, he was a miracle worker but he could also take time to rebuke. You know, we've been talking about bears all week long. There was this little incident with the bears I'm talking about tonight. There's times that prophets have to rebuke. What does a prophet look like? He is a man in this, in this consideration that has a double portion of the man who he poured water on his hands. Somewhere along the line, your greatness will begin with you being a servant. Whether it's in a Sunday school class, driving a van, cleaning the restrooms, whatever it may be, holding the door, using a prayer chain, whatever it is to pour water on the prophet's hands, start right there. Just see how blessed you can get there. He's healed the bad water in chapter 2. The Lord comes on him in chapter 3. In chapter 4, he says to the widow, go borrow vessels, borrow not of you. In uh, chapter 4, he raises a little boy from the dead. In chapter 5, he cleanses Naaman the leper. In chapter 6, his discerning of Gehazi's covetousness spirit causes him to place the curse of leprosy upon Gehazi. You see, there's times to do miracles. There's times to call out the bears. There's times to call wickedness and sin exactly what it is. That's a prophet. Notice also tonight, they had a straight place. What is this? It's an inadequate place. Don't get this confused. This narrowness is not desirable. It's no longer meeting the need on many levels. And this can be personal or it can be collective. How narrow has your prayer life become? How narrow has your devotions become? How narrow is your attendance upon the means of grace as opposed to the wide berth that you give your secular interests? This narrowness, this choking, stifling narrowness is going to hinder you. You know, when you're in a straitjacket, there's things you can't do. Breathe, for what? You're motionless. You can scream. You can writhe. Some people are in a spiritual straitjacket. But to this group, it's a collective statement. They've gotten together and they said, we come in agreement, this place is stifling us. This place has us in a straitjacket. You see, there are places that in our movement that are like this too. I've traveled all around. I've been a few places. I've hunted for restrooms in a church. They were in the bowels of the basement. In some dark corner, somebody thought it was best to put the restrooms 
as far in the back corner in a dark basement as they could with no signs. You're feeling your way down the hall. They told you they're in the basement. They are. They need white canes at the top of the steps. But they're down there. You know, I can't get over how straight we've become. We become so run down and neglected and ugly and unsightly narrow. Your place is almost too narrow to invite visitors to. It's just too ugly. Ugly has become the order of the day to you. You see, you see it every Sunday. You've grown up with that. You remember when that was new 60 years ago. And you're just real satisfied with it. But it's ugly. It's unwelcoming. When people walk in, they say, this place is so out of date, I don't think I want to hang around here. You know, we say, oh, I'd rather be old-fashioned. Well, go ahead. I like antiques, too. When it comes to the church, I want pristine. I want beautiful. I want attractive. Is that your soapbox? Yes, it is. Some churches are inadequate to hold their crowd. Some other churches are adequate to hold their crowd, but the parking is inadequate. People have to park three and four blocks away. They're parking in front of some people's homes. They find nasty notes on their parking. This is our part. We live here. We have nowhere else to park. What are you doing? Your church is on the corner of two no parking streets. You say, you don't know. Yes, I do. I pastored one. <laughs> Our building was adequate after I opened the balcony that had been closed 40 years. Somebody drywalled over it dumbly. And when I got there, I said, it's a nice church, but it's too small to have any success. When I first got there, we had about 30 people, 35. The first revival, I found every chair I could find in the church basement, brought them upstairs. They had just redone the church inside. It was beautiful. But all the chairs from the basement were in the old color of the church, orange. <laughs> I brought 60 chairs up from the basement. I set them all around. And a lady came in. She smirked at me. She said, looks like you're expecting a crowd. And I said, I am. <laughs> and you know, before the week was over, there were people sitting in all those chairs. You get what you ask for. You see, we're too narrow. You need a better parking lot. You know, your church is just too narrow because there's no welcome there. We've actually gone through an entire week of revival before we met the pastor's wife. On Saturday night, she says, hi. We're so glad you've been here this week. I'm the pastor's wife. We wondered all week who she was or where she was. I went to one church and I walked in the door. I was the evangelist. My picture was on the flyer. Apparently, I hadn't really changed that much. And no one said a word. I walked in, thought someone, I didn't really know who the pastor was, and then no one said, oh, hello, we'll, we'll get the pastor, we'll be right back. Nobody said a word. I hung around in the foyer for nobody came to me and said, we're glad to see you, we're glad you're here, we're praying for you. Nothing, just nothing, just nothing. So finally, about two minutes before the service was going to start, and we were the singers too. My wife said, am I supposed to play the piano or the organ? Or I said, I don't know. She said, well, you need to find the pastor. I said, I don't know who he is. I said, he needs to find me. So we just went up and sat on the front seat. And he finally deigned 
to come down and say he was the pastor. Oh my, I was put out. <laughs> and put off. If the speaker of the hour, the invited workers, don't feel a welcome, what do you think visitors feel? You know, others are in a straight place simply because they have a prophet and the followers are bigger than their building. Now that's the problem I want to talk about. You see, building and expansion are necessary to see what God might want to do. Building is, is necessary in the church because if your church needs more room or more parking, don't vote no. That is dumb. <laughs> don't vote no. Vote yes. We can't afford that. No, you can't afford not to do that. No, no, no. Some people love to be the no man, the abominable no man. <laughs> I was in one church. I had 66 people, members voted on me. I had one no. Did you know who it was? Yes. The most negative person in the church. She came to me after church. She said, well, I guess you wondered who the no vote was. I said, well, I guess I did. She said, I promised God years ago I'd vote no on all the preachers. <laughs> you see, if you have a pastor that's interesting enough and has the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the voice of God and the power of the Holy Ghost upon him, then you're going to grow. And just get ready. Just get ready. You're going to grow. You see, God wants to do something for you. They had an Elisha in their midst, and when they did, don't be surprised if your building is soon inadequate for your future. Pastors of small churches, get God on your pastor by praying for him. Pastors of small churches, take your job seriously more seriously than your phone more seriously than all the apps you get on to come up with a message that somebody else has already studied out if you can't build the church any other way build it on kids Some people came to me and they said, Brother Mitchell, our church had been closed. I was already pastoring the church. They said, would you consider coming out on Thursday nights and just seeing what you could do with our church? It's closed. So I told the town church, I said, listen, I'm going to start going out in the country and I'm going to start seeing what I can do about the country church out here. It has no pastor. They gave me leave. I went out. We had two people. Not, not so encouraging. A building with no restrooms or not encouraging at all a building with restrooms outside hidden no lights I said well we got to do something here so I said I'll tell you what let's have some flyers made and announce a children's service on Thursday nights we don't have any adults so we put out flyers children welcome and we put uh, anything we can think of that made it sound interesting <laughs> you see years ago when I was poor in water when I was nine in my little church they needed somebody to teach the four-year-old class and they came to me and said Raleigh would you teach the four-year-old class till we can find somebody and I said, yes. And I did. Good. And then never found anybody. <laughs> and later I was teaching the 12 year olds. I was pouring water. Yep. Yep. And while I was at that little church trying to get something going, I bought the Betty Lucan's flannel graph set. Good. Oh, yeah. I did not know that it came in a bolt that you had to cut apart. <laughs> 
I was so shocked when it came in the mail. It was a, a bolt of cloth like they sell at Walmart. My, my hands were raw. I begged God to help me get it cut out. I was so sick of it. And then I said, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. There's two boxes full of figures. You can order X amount of backgrounds. I don't know how to keep this going and keep the kids interested. And, and, do, and the Lord said, you got to keep talking while you're putting the figures up. You got to get your figures laid out way ahead and pile them in little piles all over the pulpit. And then while you're talking, you're just looking at the kids and you grab a pile of figures and you start putting them up there. You say, oh, what do I do if I got to change the scene? No, no, no. You have four planograph backgrounds set up. Four. They're already ready. The king's chamber, the dungeon, the street scene, the desert. Desert at night, you put on dark blue felt, then put the desert on. Desert at night. The three kings, the palm tree. A color wheel from a 1940s Christmas tree makes that scene fantastic. I want to tell Jonah there's no whale big enough in the set to swallow him. <laughs> so I went to town and bought a bowl of brown flannel and made a big old whale so I could slip old Jonah inside there. You know, you got to do something. Kids aren't going to just sit there in your class and write in a dumb little book. They do that at school all week and they're sick of that. They want somebody to keep their attention. What happened to your Betty Lucan's flannel graph set? Where did you bury that? You say, oh, those are old methods. No, they're not. They're so old that everybody's throwing them away, and when you get them out, kids are like, wow! The sheriff of Newcastle, Indiana, whatever county, the Henry County, his son calls me the flannel graph king. Started using flannel graph. First week, we had four kids. I said, kids, whoever brings their grandma next Thursday night gets a prize. Next Thursday night, we had eight kids, four grandmas, and one aunt. I said, now wait a minute, next, next Thursday night's uncle night. And I bought some nice prizes. I wanted this thing to happen. And you know, before long, we had about 30 kids, and we had bribed about 30 adults to show. So I thought, hey, I can start preaching a little bit now. So I had, I'd do the kids thing, and then I'd transition into a short message for the adults. And that church is still going. They have a full-time pastor. And I kept the town church open too. It got to the place they were almost jealous of the country church. You see, you don't have to be fancy. You just have to be creative. I've been places where I was more creative than my children's workers were. I don't want to have a come to Jesus meeting. But I, I was too nice. Okay, got to hurry, 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 got to hurry. Let's skip that, let's skip that, let's skip that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know what that all was? You don't care how many you have anymore. Your attendance board's gone. It's in some closet somewhere because you don't, you don't want anybody to know how bad it's gotten. You don't want to be reminded what the record attendance is. I think I'll stay there. <laughs> the past records are haunting, and you don't want to be reminded. And, you know, really, it's not all about how many we have. Yes, it is. I, I talked to one preacher. I said, how many did you have, son? He said, as many as the Lord wanted me to. I said, uh-uh. 
I knew the church. I said, God said, go fill my house. That's how many God wants, a full house. Anything less than that is substandard. Uh, get that attendance board back out, you little whiner. I was at church last Sunday. I was so proud of them. Galax, Virginia. Anybody here from there? Nobody. At 11 a.m. sharp, sitting on the platform, proudest moment of the meeting. Somebody slips out of a hallway and puts the number on the board. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I told the people at one church I went to, they put the attendance up on Sunday night. Uh-uh. No. Just no. I want that number on that board at 11 a.m. And if anybody comes in late, march your little self up there and change it again. I want to know how many are here so I can say on the live stream goodbye from Plainfield, Indiana where the attendance board says 148. Somebody messaged that too bad your church is half empty. Smack, smack. <laughs> well, at least I know how many I had. I know the church holds 300. We're working on that. I was. I'm Pastor Emeritus now. That means pastor who has no uh, authority is history. No responsibilities. But we love you and we'll call you back anytime we want at our, at our, at our desire. I'm still Pastor Emeritus, and I'm still listening at the end of the service for him to announce how many is there, because I still want to know. You see, if you were part of a corporation, you wouldn't say, well, we don't really need to know the tr treasury report, or how many new stores we have, or how things are looking numerically. That's ridiculous. That's the bottom line. However many souls are in your church or on your live stream, that's interesting to know. Okay, that was the part I was leaving out. I decided not to. I'm back now. And the cry here is, every man a beam. They've gotten together and they said, we're going to build. And we're all going to help. They agree. This place is too straight. We're in agreement. We've got to do something. If you want to know the story about that, just talk to Brother Zachman. Oh, he's got pictures of his baby. Oh, did the Zekmans have a baby? Yes, they did. John Zekman. They took a small church that nobody wanted and now they have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful church and he has so many pictures on his phone that iCloud rains twice a day. <laughs> and I could name churches all around where they're getting ready to build. Galax, Virginia just bought five acres. Next time I go, probably a big new church there. They need it. People came in Sunday morning and were like, where are we going to sit? And I was thinking, uh, don't they have a head usher here? Somebody needs to be back there in the back helping people find a chair. Hey, I like that. Beaver Town. You know, oh, they got such a big building down there. Yes, they need to build right now. I've already told them how they can do it. 
I said, don't hire those fancy architects. They know what they're doing. They're not only his people. I'll draw these plans for you free. <laughs> I've already told Dunn Cannon what they could do. Jeremy's on it. Next time I go, it's going to be something to see. Jeremy, are you here? Please forgive. <laughs> you know, they said, let's fall every man a beam. And then they said, Elijah, please go. They didn't say, well, bless God, we don't need the pastor here to start the service. We don't need the pastor on the church board. We don't need the preacher, the pastor having a key to the school. I knew one church the pastor didn't have a key to the school. He wasn't welcome. Oh. I'd have fixed them. I'd have broke in. <laughs> I'd have changed all the locks. And I'd have said, see the pastor for a key. <laughs> you said, you would not. If you know me, you know I would. <laughs> I went to one church. They built a new church. Didn't put air conditioning in it. It was so hot in there, you couldn't breathe. I said, brother, let's surprise the crowd and just get a roll of 220 wire and wire it into the box in the basement, roll it up the stairs, roll it down the aisle, go buy a big air conditioner, put it in the window, plug that baby in and turn it down to 62. <laughs> oh, he said, oh, I will, oh, I, will, I would do that. I said, I would, and I have. You see, there's some things that just really you don't need a board meeting for. It's just common sense. Do you honestly think someone's going to come and sit in your church in a straight jacket? No. Just no. This bunch realized they needed the pastor present. They said, please go. And he said, I'll be content and go with you. Good move. They didn't realize how bad they're going to need him in a little bit. What are they doing? They're cutting down wood. Verse 4. Now here's what I want to talk about briefly. The axe. For every work, there is a spirit of the axe. In the church, in your personal life, in your family life, in your work, there is a spirit of the axe. The axe represents handheld busyness handheld busyness and you are going to be on the business end of the acts you know what in that is you say oh the big the big steel head with the sharp blade that's me no oh no the handle is you that's the business end of the acts you see the acts can't pick itself up and swing itself and that's what some of you think you think the axe is going to pick itself up and build your church uh-uh some of you don't even know where your axe is some of you don't even have a hatchet uh. For every work in the church, there's an axe, and without it, going forward is impossible. This axe must needs be sharp. If you can't swing an axe, then get you a hatchet and use that for a while. And then go to the axe and learn to swing it and begin to feel the weight of, of, its, of its strength. Begin to understand how it works. You'll break a few handles because you'll overswing, but you're trying. One day I had five axes and mauls, splitting mauls in my truck. My son Andy was along. Andy is a bright young man, but he's very hard on tools. 
We went home with five axe heads and five handles. He really swings, but he misses sometimes. One of his bosses said, Andy's really a good worker, but he's hard on tools. The axe. It's time for you to sharpen up, Sunday school teacher, because your Sunday school class has become dull as it can be. Your kids don't even want to come. They only come to get the prize you give at the end. Don't say, oh, my class is so full, they love me. Uh Uh-uh, they love the gift bag. (laughs) Sharpen your ax. Let's build, let's, let's remodel. Let's pray. Let's get the Holy Ghost down on the service. Let's make cutting a priority. Let's make sharpness the order of the day. And the next thing we learn about the ax is this. It has apparently shown signs of separation from the handle for quite a while, and yet it's gone unaddressed. Now, if you don't know anything about an axe, let me just tell you. I went to one of my pastorates in my early years, and after I accepted the church and got there, they said, we forgot to tell you. The parsonage and the church both have wood heat, and the pastor cuts all the wood. And we furnished the chainsaw and the gas. How sweet of them. <laughs> and I cut 22 ricks of wood. We burned it all up the first winter. Green. I didn't know. I brought tons of green lumber I just cut and put it in the church basement. It smelled bad. I'd open the windows of the church for several weeks. It was awful. It it was like a cow barn had been installed. I didn't realize. I thought, boy, it'll dry out good down here. I learned how to I learned how to swing an axe. I learned how to, to chop wood. I learned how to use a chainsaw because I had to. And I learned some things really quick about using an axe. You can tell when the head is slipping. You can feel that in the handle. You sense that the the head of the axe is slightly moving. But in your head you're saying, it's not going to come off. And then you take it and punch it down on the ground. And it tightens up again. Back to business. About two minutes later, slip, slip, slip. You can tell when your axe has a problem. It's shown up long before you lost the head off of it. You sensed it. You knew it. And did nothing. You see, when the axe loses its head, you are left with the handle. You know, no axe is usable for much, even in the hands of an an express woodsman if there's no head on it. If you mix sharpness and caution, with a spirited axe man, progress is ahead. Sharpness and caution. Every man a beam. That's the call. That's the call. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. What else do we know about the axe? Both parts are necessary to go forward. There is the possibility of a lost axe head. The cry of the sorrowful woodsman is, Alas, master! When the axe head goes into the water, there's a cry of alarm. When do you remember hearing the word alas? Alas! And did my Savior bleed? And did my sovereign die? Would he devote 
his sacred head for such a worm as I? Alas. You see, alas means utter astonishment and wonder. And when you lose the axe head, you are suddenly confronted with an alas moment that you are not in control at all. The power is gone and you knew it was leaving and you had, nothing, had done nothing about it. It's an alas moment. Another fact about the Acts that has been kept secret till now. It's a borrowed axe. You see, when you're using borrowed stuff, you really don't care about keeping it in shape. Yeah, borrowed stuff's easy to get. Somebody came to me one night and said, you did a good job preaching Marshall Smart's sermon. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. That sermon is not Marshall Smarts. He said, oh, yes, it is. I've got a tape of it. I said, you are wrong. I went home and found a 1915 Preacher's Helps book. Took it to him the next night and said, there's Marshall Smarts' sermon right there. He says, oh, sorry. <laughs> you see, we went both to the same helps book. <laughs> Only I just run about 20 years behind. I never heard him preach that. And you know what? We all need helps. We need God to help us, and, and there's all kinds of ways you can. My dad said, Rollin, if you get a sermon idea out of a book, it's worth $25. You can explain that to your wife when you're buying books at camp meeting. <laughs> Alas, it's borrowed. Oh, now we find out he didn't have an ax at all. He borrowed that. You see, you don't have an ax either. It's not about your talents at all. It's not about your preaching ability that runs in your family. It's not about your ability to do children's work. It's all borrowed from God. You know, Rush Limbaugh used to say, he was so proud of himself, talent on loan from God. And I said, you know what, that's, that's, that's me. If I've got any talents, it's on loan. Amen. That's true. And preachers, you can just puff yourself up all you want, but everything you got's borrowed. Amen. It's all borrowed. You're going to miss that axe head when it falls into the water and sinks to the bottom. There stands the astonished woodcutter with only the handle. That's how preachers feel on Sunday morning when their sermon goes splat. <laughs> You're sitting in there in your room typing away, oh, this is going to be so good. <laughs> Things spitting out the copies over here. You're adding it to your collection on your thing, iPad thing. It's going to be so good. Got that ready on Monday. I can just lay around all week and watch stuff on my phone, I can talk to all my friends, I can go fishing, I can go sporting, I can go mountain climbing, I can go skiing. No. No. That's what happens when you get the <laughs> look. When your pastor does that on Sunday morning, you'll know. There's a look that comes along with this alas thing. And the crowd's all saying, alas. <laughs> they saw it fall in the water too. On the second page, 
and you're still droning on like an airplane motor or a Hoover sweeper from the 40s, you've already lost them. The ax fell in the water and they saw it. You're going to miss that ax head. <sighs> Elisha says, well, where did it fall? And he knew. And so do you. You remember when you quit feeling power in prayer? You remember when you lost the burden for a certain thing, a certain person? You remember. You know. Paul Gray told me a joke. I just feel like it fits here. Two people went into a, a pet store. There was a big parrot sitting there. The parrot looked over at the couple and said to the man, he said, you're stupid and your wife's ugly. The owner came out, grabbed the parrot out of the cage, smacked him around, stuffed him back in the cage and said, I've told you not to treat the customers bad. The old parrot looks around. Man goes back in the room. Parrot kind of straightens up, looks over at the couple and says, Hey! They said, What? And he said, You know. <laughs> Thank you, Paul Gray. <laughs> you know where it fell. Don't you sit there and pretend that you don't remember a day you were more excited about God's work than you are now, that you made more calls than you do now, that you miss more services now than you did then, that you take two or three nights off a revival and don't feel a bad thing about it. You know where that ax head fell. There was a time you were front and center, ready to go. How long has it been since your horn's been to church? Your accordion your flute, your violin, your kettle drum, your bass fiddle. They're at all at home in some closet. Your parents paid good money to have your lessons taught. They went without things to buy those instruments. How dare you leave them at home to rot while the church is as quiet as a dormouse. I went to one church, the instrument cases were laying under the front seats everywhere. I said, we're going to have a great orchestra in this meeting. Monday night, nothing. Tuesday night, nothing. Wednesday night, nothing. Thursday night, nothing. Friday night, nothing. Saturday night, nothing. I said to the pastor, is this just an ornament case collection? <laughs> or are there actual instruments in those? He said, oh, the orchestra's taking the week off. I said, you have got to be kidding me. Oh. You know where it fell. You're not concerned if there's not a joyful noise at church. You're just not concerned. There was a time you brought that little case in your hand, you sat on the front seat and played. You pulled your little accordion out and you squeezed that box. And you pulled those bellows way over here. I love it when I can do that. I forgot how to play the accordion, but I'm, I'm getting back at it. Good. I got me a new one. Good. And I, while my wife's gone, I'm practicing. Good. I said, I'm going to get that back. I lost it during COVID. I'm going to get it back. Good. I love to pull that bellows clear down. Some of them have a, a, a pattern in them. I want everybody to see the pattern in that then I love to pull it back up and squeeze the sound back out of it. It's a great feeling. It's been a while since you felt that because you don't know where your recording is right now. Thank you, brother. It's so good to have the Crusaders on the front row. You know, you're always going to get a little bit of amens and interest. Where did it go? 
Elisha says, where did it fall? Okay. Oh, no. You say, that's the end of the Acts. It's gone. The other sons of the prophets are heading to the edge of the river because there's a secret. Their axes are borrowed too. You see, they're not really woodsmen. They're sons of the prophets. They borrowed these axes. Their axes are borrowed too, and if this boy can lose his, they can lose theirs. And they're interested in seeing the outcome of what happens when you lose an axe into a river. You see, we're all using borrowed axes. But the prophet comes over. It's a good thing he went along, isn't it? We don't need the pastor on that committee. Yes, you do, because you're about to vote in something stupid. Now, the, the person that this happened to is here. He happened to be a trustee in our church. And at, in, in that particular church, the pastor doesn't sign any documents. The trustees do. The church secretary does. So uh, this, this gentleman who's here tonight, who's a good friend of mine, said, Brother Mitchell, don't, you don't need to bother with coming to the bank. You know, you really, we're the ones that are going to sign, da-da-da. But I went. So they're passing papers across the table, and we're all. And I said, wait a minute, hold up. You are just getting ready to sign the church over to these people. This is the deed and abstract for the church. Not the lot. Not the parsonage. The church! Oh. Oh. So we had to reschedule the closing. You're here, dear brother. We're friends. But I'm glad I came to the meeting. You see, there was someone that knew how to get that axe back. Hallelujah. You can get it back. Yes, sir. Elisha just goes over there so casually, sticks a stick in the water. And the Bible said the axe did swim. You say, oh, it just kind of floated up. Uh-uh. It swam. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. It swam. I don't care what your little funny version says. King James says it swam, and I believe it did. I don't want to hear all your nonsense. I didn't call Paul Kaufman to check on this. Sometimes I call him and say, this, can this be this? He says, no, Brother Mitchell, go away. Run. It's empty as a gourd. I didn't run this by him. I think it is too good to be empty. I tell you one thing, folks. When the axe head comes to the top, it's not just floating. It's on its way up. Oh, I want to tell you, if you want the power back, you can get it. You can get it. It'll swim right up. It'll swim right up to the top. Yep, yep. There is a way back to getting in the woods again. Yes, There's a way back to sharpness. There's a way back to feeling effective. There's a way back to seeing your church go forward. There's a way back. At the call of the master. Alas! The axe head did swim. It's back. It's back. I'm back. Last year when I left here, I said to my wife, I'll never be back to IHC. I only got to come to two services. I wasn't able to come. I'm back. Amen. What happened? He took out his hand. He reached out his hand and took it. 
It's back. It's back. That's all. It's just back. And I can hear the sons of the prophets saying, Whew, check your handle. You, you need, you need a, a drive a wedge in the top of that right there. That's how you fix axe heads that are loose. Bang, bang on the ground, don't get it. You've got to drive a metal wedge in to tighten that handle up to that. You better check that. And they're all saying, oh, I'm so glad it didn't happen to me. So embarrassing. Yes, the axe head in the water is embarrassing. And some of our situations are embarrassing. And your testimonialist prayer meeting nights are embarrassing. I got so I, just, I, don't, I don't mess with people. I say, anybody got a testimony? Nobody does. Say, so let's stand. I'm sick of it. I'm not going to beg you. If God hadn't been good enough to you to get your little old feet up, you just go home with your little handle. <laughs> I tell people, if you haven't testified for at least two weeks, hit the altar. You need to. You see, God's done more for you than you let on. It's been a while since you had power. It's been a while since you took a little run. It's been a while since you got up and screamed. It's been a little while since you did that little jump you used to do. It's just been a little while since anything has happened. The church has blessed you. Let's stand. R.B. and his companion are coming. I don't know his name. He's a great guy, though. You know, after somebody plays 40 years, I finally learned their name. About the time I had Ben down, Ben went to heaven. Now I've got to learn somebody new. But I want to ask you a question. I said, you're funny enough to be in the comedy bar, and that's what a lady told me. I said, but guess what? In between all that silliness, there's some truth there that can get a hold of people. That's just my way. That's my ax head. You say, you see the funniest things in the funniest places. I know it. It drives me crazy. I want to be organized like some of these other guys. I want to be scholarly. But no, I have to preach on a sixth grade level. Because that's where you guys are. <laughs> but this is laughingly serious. It's hideously noticed. And I want to just open the altar tonight while these men play. Turn the organ up, please, so we can hear it. Thank you. I want you to stand with me tonight, and I want to ask you a question. Where did it fall? How long has it been since you've been out to the grindstone out behind Grandpa's shed and cranked that stone and watched the sparks fly while you, while you ground down a, a, a sharp edge on that ax? I wonder all over the crowd tonight, you say, I'm a Sunday school teacher, I want more of a burden, come on. I'm a children's worker, but I'm not feeling it. I'm sick of kids right now, come on. I'm a young pastor that has struggles finding something to preach, come on. I, I, I'm a layman who is starving to death. Come on. You see, if you get more of God on you, your pastor will never need to preach. You'll shout so much, you'll never have to get up. Problem solved. If you pray for him enough, he may start preaching better. Come on. I know where it fell. I know where it fell. And I'm coming to the master. And I'm saying, alas, I cannot do this on my own. I didn't learn enough in Bible school to make this church grow. I must depend on the Holy Ghost.
How long has it been since you bawled on the way to work? How long has it been since you had a hymnal beside your chair and you picked out a hymn to be the hymn of the day? And you just kind of went over it during the day and cheered yourself and was blessed. I pulled the car over when I was running door to door milk. Early, early in my life, I was running door to door milk back before Walmart happened. I got so blessed. One day in my milk truck, I passed three stops. One of them was a little farm lady that was waiting on her half and half her eggs and butter to bake that day. And I went flying past her and left her in a cloud of dust, realizing I had missed my stops. I wiped my tears from my face, turned the truck around, and when I pulled in, she said, Milkman, what in this world are you doing? I was standing here waving my apron, and you flew past me like you were in another world. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I was in another world. Come on, if you're coming, we're not begging. No singing. I'm sick of begging. I'm ready to see people that want to move. Anybody else? I want to sharpen the axe. They're still coming. We're going to hold on just a little bit, a little longer, folks. They're still coming. So I'm the best pastor in the conference. Ha. Ha. Just ha. Somebody told me one day, so I was in a camp meeting with H.E. Darnell. He said, everybody told me I out preach Darnell every night. I looked down the table at him and I said, they lied. You don't preach, out preach H.E. Darnell. The very idea that little young whippersnapper thought he was doing that. His axe had fallen in the water. You know, it's time we laid down some things that we've been claiming as ours. And said, Lord, my talents really aren't mine. If you have to hunt all the way through the Bible and can't find anything to preach, you need to be at this altar tonight. I don't go fishing for sermons. I'm out in the lake and the fish jump into the boat. So you hunt for sermons? No, they, they jump into the boat. Because I realized a long time ago, God's doing this. God's doing this. And when God shows me the text, then I get busy and dig it out. How long has it been? It's a great song they've chosen. Are you about done? Or are you still coming? We owe it to these people. My daughter said, Dad, please don't preach too long. I've already done it. I want everybody to forgive me for being long. I've been accused of being a stetler. Some girl ran up to me and said, I'm just so excited I got to have my picture taken with your son, Paul. She's running her mouth so fast I couldn't stop her. She said, all you Stettlers look alike, you preach alike, you're all long. And just zoom, she went away. My mouth was open, alas. <laughs> That's to cry, alas. You're standing there with your mouth open and the handle's in your hand and you're not doing anything about it. And I'm asking myself why. Folks are still coming, but we owe it to them to gather in with them. So come on, everybody. Come on, children. You, you young children that know God, just come right on up here. You're just as important to this altar service as the adults are. Come on, kids. Come on, kids. These kids know how to pray. They have great faith, and I invite them to come and pray with seekers. I want the preachers to come, the laymen to come, the little old ladies that can't kneel. Come on and sit in the front if they're somewhere. Stand if you need to. Let's do what we got to do. Let's have a season of prayer.
Let's ask God the Holy Ghost to put the stick in the water tonight. And let's watch as some axe heads begin to float to the top and we see the eager seekers reaching out to get them again. And we see the sons of the prophets saying, oh wow, that could be me. I need to check my axe handle. That could be me right there. Oh folks, tonight this is the cry of our movement. We need more of the Holy Ghost. Dear Lord, we have learned how it feels to stand with our mouth open and a handle in our hand. We knew things were slipping, but we did nothing about it. And Lord, we also know what it feels like when the wet axe head swims to the top and we reach out and get it and with a sigh of relief, we shake off the water and put it back on the handle and head straight to the garage to drive a wedge in the top and say, oh God, I'm purposing in my heart, this is not going to happen to me. I'm going to stay sharp. I'm going to keep the power where it belongs and I'm going to be on the business end of this thing and I'm going to make things happen. I'm going to fall down a log I'm not going to let others have a pile of logs over there that they've cut down and me have hardly any. I'm going to get down to business with my prayer life, with my Sunday school class, with a youth group, with a church, with my own private family. Dear Jesus, all we've got to offer is ourselves all we have to offer you is a handle the business end of a handle that's the only thing we've got to offer but if you would deign to come and let the axe head float to the top I am going to reach out and get it again and if my axe has been in the garage and I don't even know where it is, Lord, I'm going to go out and hunt my axe down because I'm tired of living a life where there's no trees falling. I'm tired of being dry and dead and going in as a spectator at church. I want to participate again. I want to shout again. I want to testify again. I want to be used of God again. I want to keep my pastor in my prayers. I want God. Lord, I pray for the churches that need to be remodeled. They don't have any money. Lord, I pray that you will help someone to get the Spirit upon them to figure out how they can raise the money to fix the problem. Don't just let us sit around and say, well, we have no money. We have no money. We can't do anything. Oh, yes, you can. If you buy the first gallon of paint, God's going to be there to help you buy the second. You can do something. And what, the reason you're not is because the axe head's somewhere in a shed. You haven't seen it. You're complacent. It's time to get the power back. Dear Jesus, please help us now. This is a pleasing sight to see this many people who are concerned enough about what they're doing and what their ministry is and where they stand to humble themselves to pray. Now, Lord, I ask that the Holy Ghost will put the stick in the water and you'll bring swimming these axe heads to the top. Lord, we're tired of being growthless and ugly. We used to be the trendsetters in the, in the holiness movement. We built the new churches. 
We had our parking lots full of cars. We were trendsetters. In the 60s and 70s, the Holiness people built more churches probably than any other denomination in the state of Indiana. They were dotted all over central Indiana, church dedications all the time on Sunday afternoons. I went to so many of them because somebody stepped out on faith and said, bless God, we're going forward, we're gonna build a building here. We're willing to take the weight of the debt. We believe God's gonna help us make it. We're not stepping out foolishly, but we're stepping out prayerfully. And we're gonna make this happen because it's just the thing to do. The straight jacket has gotten too much for me. I can't handle it anymore. I can't stand the way I've been bound up. I can't stand the way that I sit unresponsive when my pastor's pouring out his heart. And I scream with delight when my grandchildren drive up out in front. I'm tired of two standards of joy. I'm tired of two standards. And I want the joy of the Lord to come on me. Brother Daryl Stetler, I don't know where you are. Wherever you are, come please. Here comes Brother Plank, Brother Stetler's praying earnestly with seekers. Brother Plank, I don't know what else to say. People are still praying, but if you have any advice or anything to say to the seekers, please do it. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Mitchell. I say amen to the truth. What a unique message, a unique man, but God has used him to speak to our hearts tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. If you're praying, if you're seeking, you seek on. We're in no hurry tonight. Let's just have a good season of prayer again here this evening, wherever you are. And I just can't thank you enough. I know many have to leave, but this is a huge crowd tonight. At least 4,600 people are here tonight. And most of those people are still here. They're still here. I want to tell you something. The holiness people still want the glory. They still want God to move. I thank you for staying with us tonight. Wherever you are, let's lift our hearts again. Let's tell God we want to do our very best. Thank God. Father in heaven, we love you tonight. We thank you for every one of these who have stepped out on purpose to come to this altar, to say, oh God, do something fresh in my heart. Don't let me become stagnant. Don't let me, oh God, just go on and go through the motions. Don't let me ever get careless with the holy things. Lord, we thank you for it. But Lord, I imagine that every single one of us in this room could have come to the altar tonight just to tell you one more time, we're not in this to play games. We're in this for keeps. Oh God, we want to see a moving of your spirit across our churches, our schools, our mission fields. Oh God, we don't want to be lukewarm and we don't want to be haphazard about your work. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Move on our souls tonight. Lord, many of us perhaps have general areas where we're just praying, oh God, even if we're tired, would you make us awake again to the things around us that matter most? But Lord, perhaps across this congregation, there are specific areas where as was brought out tonight, we know where the ax has fallen. I pray, oh God, that you'll help us <coughs> to do what needs to be done, to put things in reverse gear, to make wrongs right, to make better priorities in our lives, to put you first in a Christless world, to keep Jesus first in our life, and to make your will prominent and preeminent in all that we do, that Christ might be preeminent in our lives. Oh God, as people are seeking thee around this altar, keep a spirit of seeking upon them until they are satisfied in thee tonight. And across this congregation, even as we go our separate ways, Lord, in a profound way, You've been with us this day. 
in the revival rally, in the um, youth service, even in the pre-service tonight, your presence was so rich. And now tonight, through your servant, Brother Mitchell, you have spoken to us in a unique and practical and powerful way. And so, Lord, we thank you for your moving among us. Give us a good night's rest and help us to come back for the last great day of the feast, refreshed and revived and determined to mind you and obey you. Lord, we may not all be able to testify from this floor, but we can testify with upraised hands and standing to our feet and obeying thee and help us to come tomorrow with a praise on our lips. For all that you do, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue to pray as you feel.